Hello, friends. Welcome to Chickenlandia and welcome to Bok Talk, your 100% friendly backyard chickens show. Oh, my goodness. Today we are going to talk about handling stress in chickens. And if someone is out there listening and they can tell me how to handle it as a human, <laughs> I, need, I need that information. <laughs> Oh my goodness. There's so much stuff going on in Chickenlandia, guys. Um, you will find out some very big news on Wednesday if you watch my video. And if you're listening to the podcast, then you need to go back to the future. And like, I, don't, I don't know how that works, <laughs> but the video has already been released. So you can, you can go watch it on my YouTube channel. Um, big news coming, like two big things, actually. There's something big at the beginning of the video and something big at the end of the video that has been going on. And um, it's a lot. There's a lot going on. But today we are going to talk about stress in chickens. I do have a question that someone submitted to Chickenlandia. And if you want to submit a question to Bok Talk so that you can be chicken famous, you can go to my website, welcome to chickenlandia.com, go to the contact section. And there's a little like form that you can fill out. Now I'm going to be honest, we've been having problems with this form. So first, please try it because we're really trying to get it to work. So it's the con contact section. There's a little drop down menu. You choose ask a chicken question. You can submit a question through there. And if you can do it, that's the best thing. But if it doesn't work for you for whatever reason, and we're really trying to figure this out, um, just send me an email, uh, president at welcome to chickenlandia.com and just put chicken question in the subject line so that I can see your question and possibly answer it on Bok Talk. Now, I get a lot of questions. So uh, there's just no way, especially right now, that I can answer all of them. And I apologize for that. I wish I could answer all of them, but it's just too much. But you might hear back from me or you may hear back from Kelsey, which is the uh, Chickenlandia presidential advisor. She's very knowledgeable. Um, or I may feature your question on Bok Talk. So that's always fun. And while you're at my website, while you are visiting, make sure that you join my mailing list, Chickenlandia Nation. It's the most elite chicken mailing list in the world. <laughs> I mean, I can make that claim, right? Uh, and, you know, you can check out my online course and all that stuff because I got an online course that is on right now. Um, back Chickenlandia's Backyard Chickens 101, a chicken course for everyone. It's a super fun online course. And um, baby chick season is almost over. Can you believe that? It is May, and usually it really starts to calm down towards the end of this month. June and July, the you know baby chicks usually aren't happening at the farm stores and stuff. You can still order them. Um, and then there'll be another little bump in the late summer, like uh, late August, early September, where, where people, where the farm stores may start having baby chicks again. But I just think the spring is a great time to kind of reboot your whole chicken game. So if you're looking to do that, or if you're a beginner, this course may be very good for you. And, and if you join Chickenlandia Nation, you might get a little coupon. So, um, so uh, hello to everybody that is watching today. Hello to those listening on the podcast. I just want to say hello to some people on the chat. Celia Perry is here. 13 Moons Homestead, thank you so much for being here, my trusty moderator. Genesa09, thank you for being here. Roger Stewart, Keto with Sharon. Victoria Fox, thank you for being here. Eddie Abernathy. Re Rhiannon, thank you so much for being here. Our wood chip garden. And Teresa Oaks, thanks guys for being here today. A lot of the regulars and oh, there's the Chickenlandia presidential advisor is here. If you guys have a burning question, and you can't wait until the end because I 
I will answer the question, the submitted question, and then a little bit later, we'll open it up for questions in the chat that if you have a burning question that you need to know the answer to right away, go ahead and tag the uh, Chickenlandia presidential advisor so she can help you out. All right, stress, stress. Let's talk about what things or conditions cause stress in chickens. And you know they are stressed because um, they might stop laying. They might start attacking each other. <laughs> uh, they might display other behavioral problems like pecking or feather eating or bullying. Um, or they might get sick because, you know, I mean, if you think about it, humans get sick when they get stressed too. Like that's a, a main reason why we get sick. We know we're, we're learning more and more about that connection every day about how our emotions are connected really to our physical wellness. Um, and chickens are no different. If they are, um, under, if they are under stress, they will, they can get sick or have other issues. Um, and so there are a few reasons that chickens will get stressed. And uh, usually it has something to do with not having their needs met. And the, these are easy because if you realize this is what's happening, then you can fix it. So um, not enough space is a really big one, guys. A really, really big one. And I think people don't realize um, sometimes, you know, they're like, oh, and I, I get these messages a lot. Oh, my chickens are pecking each other. They're pulling each other's feathers. They're bullying each other. And I'm like, okay, let's talk about how much space they're in. Now, generally, I will recommend two to four square feet of space inside a coop. And the only time I would say you can get away with two square feet per standard size chicken is if you have other places in your run where your chickens can go during the day to get out of the elements, okay? If the coop is the only place that they have really to get out of the elements, to get in the shade, to get out of rain, to get out of snow, um, to get out of really high wind, then um, you need to make sure that you have four square feet of space or more uh, in the coop per standard size chicken. Now in the run, 10 square feet of space per standard size chicken is what I recommend. Okay. And even if they have enough space, it is possible that they might get stressed out because there's not enough enrichment in that space. So, um, you know, especially if you have your chickens in an enclosed run, like I do, I know a lot of my listeners and viewers they are in the suburbs, they're in the city, or they might have their chickens in an enclosed run, even if they're out in the country. Um, if you are doing that, you need to make sure that they don't get bored in that space because bored chickens will get into trouble and they will stress each other out. So, <laughs> so let's say you have them in an enclosed run, you can give them things to do like uh, dust baths. You definitely want to have that, especially in the winter or in the, during rainy seasons, cold seasons, you want to make sure that they still have places to dust bathe. And I do have a video about that. I will leave it in the show notes and in the description about how you can make a little dust bath for your chickens. And it also, not only does it help them with their boredom, but it has the obvious benefit of, keeping them clean and keeping uh, parasites, uh, external parasites at bay. Okay. Um, extra perches in their run so they can get on them when they want to and hang out there and preen and do all their little chicken stuff. Uh, you can tie a cabbage up. A lot of people like to do that or an apple or veggies. Like I've seen like a zucchini tied up in their in their run and then the chickens will peck at it and it just gives them something to do. Um, even like a, a pecking block. Um, I know there's one called a flock block and then there's a, another brand name for one. Um, those can be good, especially if you're having pecking problems. 
those can can help. You can try that to see if that will kind of redirect them. Um, a chicken swing is always fun. A lot of people say, oh, my chickens won't don't use it, but <laughs> it's fun. Uh, just just think about ways to offer variation in their environment. And if that means, you know, just making places where they can go and hang out out of the shade, different areas for them to be in, then you can do that. OK, but you just don't want them to get bored. So other reasons why they get stressed, not enough food. Now, if you are feeding, if you are free feeding your chickens, you need to make sure that they have food at all times. Okay. It's sometimes it's easy to, you know, since you're free feeding them and you're used to the, them just going to the container, a few days can go by and you don't realize, wow, I haven't filled up the container and they've been out of food and chickens are not really, you know, I mean, sometimes, you know, I'll have chickens chase me around because they want me to feed them, <laughs> but you might not have chickens like that and you might not realize they don't have food and then you fill it up and they're just like on top of each other trying to get to it. And that's not a good sign. That means that they're just getting too hungry. Um, they shouldn't be attacking each other at the trying to get to food. Okay. Um, and if you are feeding them once a day, like I do, because I ferment my chickens feed, then you want to make sure that they have, a, you know, food in their bowl until at least the afternoon time. And it can be a little bit earlier in the afternoon if you also do kitchen scraps. So what I do is I feed them their fermented feed in the morning and then they eat that during the day. And then in the late afternoon, I'll go out with some ki some kitchen scraps, but only enough that they will eat, you know, before the sun goes down. Because you don't, you do not want kitchen scraps laying around your uh, coop area, your run, because that's just saying, "Hey, rats, come on and, and visit us. We've got a buffet over here." Uh, you don't want that. Um, and then obviously you want to make sure your chickens have clean water. That kind of goes without, without saying. Now I have to change my chickens water a lot because I have ducks and ducks are dirty and gross. They go and they eat and then they go to, they waddle over to the water and they put their food in the water and, and like eat it and spit in it <laughs> and, and they poop in the water and they take a bath in the water and it's like, okay, I don't want my chickens drinking that. So I have to change the water a lot. Um, so, you know, change it according to your circumstance. Obviously, if you're using like a nipple water system, you don't have to change it as much, but you need to make sure that it's not developing mildew or anything like that. Um, obviously, predation is a big one. This will absolutely cause your chickens to have lots of stress. If they're under the threat of predation, um, if there are predators coming and you're not handling it and there's repeated attacks, that is super duper stressful for your chickens. You can imagine, you know, what that would be like. So definitely you want to handle that. Now, I do not advocate uh, killing predators. I don't, I just prefer to live in harmony with them, not only because they you know, they're just critters. They don't, they're just doing what they do. <laughs> uh, they're just trying to survive, but also because I don't want to disturb my local ecosystem. Now you might think, you know, Oh, raccoons, Oh, weasels. Oh, um, possums, you know, I don't want to deal with these. They're good for nothing. Well, they eat rats. And so they, they really control the uh, rodent population in your area. And that is a very important part of your ecosystem. So if you kill off all the predators, you're going to end up with a rat infestation. And I try to tell people this, but they just, uh, <laughs> just uh, you know, I mean, I understand. I understand being upset and just wanting to get rid of the animal. But um, you need to think about balance more than anything else. So um, what I prefer to do is to just make sure that my chickens are safe. And I do that by predator proofing. Now, uh, the issue that I always run into is that it can get expensive. Um, but I find that there's a lot of materials that you can find used on like Craigslist or on free cycle, like social media groups. 
And so I do encourage people to use, to, you know, to take those avenues if um, buying new materials are a problem or they just don't want to do it because they want to be more sustainable with their practices. So definitely make sure that you are predator proofing. I do have a video all about predator proofing your run and your coop. And I haven't decided if I'm going to put the super silly one. There's one that starts out. There's two that start out really silly, <laughs> but they're funny and they've got, they've got good stuff in them. So um, I will put a video about predator proofing your coop and run in the description and in the show notes. Jonathan Linton, thank you so much for your super chat. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right. Turn in the page. I'm going to turn the page and drink some water. Yes, I have a script. <laughs> Cheating. Okay, another way that chickens will get stressed out, obviously, is if they go through some kind of trauma. Um, so uh, obviously like abuse of some kind, uh, injury, uh, attack of some kind, an accident. Um, I've had many, many rescue chickens here in Chickenlandia that have, uh, that have been through trauma. Um, and even just the, you know, like I, I had a, a chicken that her whole flock got killed by predators and the person was like, please come take her because I'm scared the predator's going to come back and I can't get to it fast enough. And, you know, and so I went and got them and that chicken has been through a lot. And when they're so stressed out like that, they're really susceptible to uh, getting sick and to getting external parasites and internal parasites. So um, do you definitely want to put some practices in place to kind of, you know, support them through that experience. So one product that I really like that I talk about all the time is called Rescue Remedy. And um, it is a homeopathic flower remedy Um it really helps to kind of take the edge off when a, a chicken or a human or whatever animal, because they have the animal kind, they have human kind, um, when they've experienced, when they're experiencing stress and there is, um, a form, you know, it's a formula of a few different flower remedies. Um, and there is a flower essence in it that, and I think it's star of Bethlehem, but that one's really good for um, a chicken just that just can't come out of the trauma that they've been through. Um, and I've witnessed that. I mean, I think there are probably people that are like, you are crazy. Like it's just a chicken. Like they don't have feelings, <laughs> but they do, <laughs> they do. And they, they can get stuck in a moment um, just like people. So you want to kind of move them out of that. Uh, another remedy that I use, it's a homeopathic. You can find it at uh, a health. Oops, sorry. Another remedy that I use is a, it's a homeopathic. You can find it at your local health food store. You can find it at Whole Foods. You can find it um, probably at like a vitamin shop or something if they have homeopathics or you can get it online. Um, and it is called aconite. Um, and you would get that in a 30 C potency. That's just a nice, um, you know, safe potency for a chicken. And it's really good if you have a traumatic event and that just happened. And like, let's say you have a predator attack. So that night you can dose your flock with aconite. And I would just do one dose of the 30 C and, you know, see how that helps. But there, it's good for, it's good for a few different things. And if you look at the label, it's going to say, I don't even know what the aconite one is going to say, but it's going to say something that's like, what, what, this doesn't say it's for chickens or it's for fright or anything, <laughs> but that's because homeopathic remedies, they are, they are indicated for many different things. And it depends on who's taking it and how they feel and all this stuff and how they're presenting sim symptoms. So it's not as uh, simple as just like, 
oh, I have a headache. I'm going to take a Tylenol. Uh, homeopathy is very different in the way that it is prescribed. So, um, but aconite, there's a saying that is called, it's, it goes, um, where there's fright aconite. And so if you have an immediate situation where everyone's freaked out, you just dose them right with aconite right then. Okay. Um, and it's also good if your chicken suddenly is sick. Um, so yeah, like, uh, they were fine in the morning and then you go in the afternoon and they're all of a sudden sick. Aconite right then. And you may do more than one dose, but I do have a, um, blog post about homeopathy for chickens and I'll put that in the show notes and in the description for you. Um, if you are moving or you're making big changes in the coop, like let's say one day you go and you paint the whole coop or whatever, that is a big deal to chickens. Like <laughs> they, do, they don't like change. And especially if you move them, like if you, if you put them all in a crate and you take them on a car ride and you're taking them to you know, the next state over and, and you get there and you're like, how come they're not laying? Well, they're not going to lay for like a month. Okay. Um, because they're stressed out like that. That's a huge deal to them. Chickens really like things to stay the same. They are creatures of habit and they like to, you know, they just, they're very methodical creatures. So, um, that will definitely put a little, uh, you know, a little unease in their heart. So, you know, during these times you can use rescue remedy. If they're, if, of course, you know, if we're moving, we're moving and they, we have to move the chickens. So you can use rescue remedy during that time and just try to keep their life as normal as possible. Try to return them to a normal schedule as soon as possible. Now construction, if construction is going on nearby really super loud sounds going on nearby. That's another um, time when chickens will experience stress. And that brings me to the question actually that I received and it is from Victoria. She says, I was just thinking ahead about the upcoming holidays. So I know it's May, but Victoria's already think she's, she's a forward thinker and she's, <laughs> she's thinking about July. So we know what happens in July the 4th of July. How do you handle the 4th of July with your flock? Are they bothered by the fireworks? Do you take any preventative measures to keep them stress free? So full disclosure, I am somebody that really doesn't like fireworks. Like <laughs> I know last time I taught, last, I was like two years ago, I did like this rant about fireworks and then somebody left a super nasty comment because People that love fireworks really love fireworks. Um, I deeply resent them <laughs> because I have five little rescue dogs. And I have uh, fireworks that go off in my neighborhood that are like right over my house that cause pollution all over my chicken yard. Um, it's pretty crazy. Illegal fireworks. <laughs> um, and so... Uh, it's, it's tough. We like, it, it, like the 4th of July for me is not fun because I'm taking care of shivering dogs all night long and it's, it's exhausting. So, um, you know, and also I don't want my house to burn down. I'm funny like that. <laughs> but anyway, um, honestly, my chickens, especially compared to my dogs, they do really well with the fireworks. Um, and I think it, it has a lot to do with the fact that I just am so methodical about their care during that time. And you can do, um, rescue remedy. I would do it like a week before, you know, and you just put a couple drops in their water every day. Um, you can put, you know, if you have one that's especially stressed out, you can put, um, a drop of rescue remedy on their back and kind of rub it in. You can do that a few times a day if that's not going to stress them out. Um, and you know, I would not do any other big changes during that time. So a week before a week after the 4th of July is not the time to 
uh, move your whole flock. It's not, <laughs> it is preferably not the time to start integrating a whole bunch of chickens together because that's a stressful situation for them too. Okay. Um, really just try to keep things the same as they always are so that they can feel very comfortable. Make sure that your chickens are in a secured coop. Um, this is not the time to accidentally leave the coop door, or the run door open. Okay. We know a lot of animals get lost on, on July 4th and it's super sad. Um, they get really, really scared. And also there's a lot of wild animals that are getting really, really scared and you don't want them coming into your yard. Um, you can also use some calming herbs in the coop. You can use uh, lavender, lemon balm, uh, lemon ver verbena, which is, I love that one, chamomile. Um, and you can even, you, you can use the essential oils if you want. I don't put essential oils on my chickens, but you can just take a paper towel, put some drops of these essential oils on the paper towel and hang it up in the coop. And that will just be calming for them. And you can do that on the days leading up to it and for like a week after. And you can I mean you can do that all the time if you want to. Um, a rescue remedy is, of course, great. Uh, and then, and I just want to let you know, you can get it at PetSmart. You can get it at the health food store. And I'll also put a link um, to... Uh, an online where you can get it online. Um, and then, like I said, just a couple drops in their water or rub, uh, drops on their back. Okay. Hold on. Doo -doo -doo. Um, this is one that you don't hear much about, but you can actually give your chicken CBD oil. <laughs> now we know, <laughs> CBD is like, it's it, it's, it's in, it is in right now. Uh, I have a dog that takes it every day. The one thing that you want to make sure is that it is pure CBD oil. Okay. W which is not cheap. If it's cheap, don't get it. <laughs> you know, it's, you want it to be pure CBD oil. You do not want it to have any THC in it. Um, and it needs to be made for ingesting. Like you don't want to get like ointment or anything like that. Okay. And you just put one drop on, uh, their, like a little piece of bread in the morning and one drop at night. Okay. And you can do that like lead cause it's cumulative. So you can do that, um, the week before the big event or the fireworks. Okay. Um, and all of the, those things that I just mentioned, they're good for any, any kind of stress, uh, any kind of disruption, moving, adding new chickens, trauma, all that stuff. Okay. But the main thing, uh, again, the main thing you want to do is make sure that you maintain that their routine so that they can feel safe. So, um, thank you very much, Victoria. You have some very lucky chickens. Their, their mother is forward thinking, um, I appreciate that. And I'm sure they do too. So thank you for your question. And if you guys want to submit a question, go to my website, welcome to chickenlandia.com. And you can submit a question through the contact form. If for some reason it doesn't work, just send me an email president at welcome to chickenlandia.com. Okay. Oh, God, I need some CBD oil right now. My back hurts. Rhiannon, thank you so much. <laughs> You're so great. Thank you so much for the super chat. She says, thank you for the 4th of July rundown. I love the 4th, and I've been a little worried about what to do. Thank you. Oh, great. And Victoria, you're welcome. Okay. Okay, guys, this is the part of the show where I answer your burning chicken questions. If you have a question for me and you want to ask it in the chat, please type it in in all capital letters so that I can see it. <laughs> because otherwise, I might not be able to see it. Um, and I will do my best to answer it. Sometimes I get stumped. It does happen. There's no prize, though. If you stump me, there's no prize. <laughs> So just go ahead and post it in all caps. Getting a drink. 
Seriously, you guys, like, I have so much stuff going on right now. You need to watch my video on Wednesday. You're going to freak out. Okay, I don't see anything, so I'm going to go up and see. I thought somebody... Okay, Celia Perry asks a question. I recently rescued a couple of hens and a rooster, and they all have mites and worms. <laughs> Boy. What should I do to get rid of these? Okay, yeah, I mean, that... I, I definitely, like, I feel like every time... And I, I talked about this, I think, was it last week? Last time? Um, how to adopt a chicken... Um, I do have a, a podcast about it and of all the things that I do. Um, if you can, Celia, your your best thing to do, especially for the worms, is to find out what kind of worm you're dealing with. Because a lot of times, and I see, you know, things recommended all the time, online um, products that are not approved for chickens, um, that are not especially great for the environment. Now, if you have an active case, I wouldn't blame anybody for uh, going to conventional medicine for that. Um, and if you decide to do that, then I would recommend going to getting a worm or getting a fecal sample and taking that to your vet to find out what you're actually dealing with, or at the very least, you know, research, uh, go online and look, look at pictures and find out exactly what you're dealing with, because there are different medications for different internal parasites. Okay. Now there are herbal treatments for, for internal parasites. Um, you might be somebody that doesn't feel comfortable doing that, or you might be somebody that does, but if you, and I think, you know, I will put a couple of, um, products in the description and in the show notes. I really like a product called Verm X. Um, it may not be strong enough depending on the situation that you have. Um, I have had very good success with it. Um, but you might need something that is stronger. Uh, Vermex, I like it because it's very gentle. But um, there are herbs that are very strong, to, uh, strong enough to get rid of parasites. There are. And I know, I know that for a fact, a, a very unfortunate fact. <laughs> and it doesn't have to do with chickens. <laughs> I wish it did. Uh, <laughs> um, now for the mites, you definitely want to treat those. Do not put these chickens together with your current flock until you've treated them. So um, you can use a pyrethroid. Uh, just make sure you don't keep it around. Your, use it around cats because it's not good for cats. It's also not great for shellfish. So if you're in like a watershed or something, you don't want to be using pyrethroids. Um, but I would, you know, if it's a super active case, I might just reach for the reach for um, pyrethrum or something like that or permethrin and use that and just knock it out like a couple of doses, 10 days apart. And you need to treat all of the chickens, you need to treat whatever environment that they're in, uh, wait 10 days and do it again and cl definitely clean out where they are. Okay. Um, or you can use diatomaceous earth. I've absolutely done that. Uh, but I usually will do three doses, 10 days apart for diatomaceous earth. And you really have to put it on them. Like you got to get it all over their body and stuff. And I do have a video about uh, treating mites and lice. I'll put that in the description and in the show notes. So good luck with that, Celia. And thank you for helping those chickens. Pogo asks a question, I have a lonely chicken, but I have ducklings and chicks. Should I keep them together so the chicken gets company? Okay, I'm not sure. So you have a chicken that's an adult, and then you have ducklings and a baby chicks. So um, even though it's just one chicken, you don't want to have them together with the babies. Uh, you don't want to have an adult chicken 
with babies that she is not the the mother of. Okay, because um, the adult chicken could and will very likely hurt the babies. Okay, so don't put them together. But if they're old enough and they can be outside during the day, it's warm enough for them to be outside. You can have them in an area where they can see where the 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 older chicken can see the babies, but she can't get to them. Okay, so you can have like a pen that is inside your chicken yard that has uh, fencing or whatever, and they can see through the fencing so they can come right up to it and look at each other and, and talk to each other and work out the pecking order and all that, but they can't get to each other. Okay, but you don't want to put a full grown chick, uh, chicken in with babies. Okay, I hope that answered your question. GB's World asks, can or do runt baby chicks grow all the way to adulthood or do they always stay smaller? I would say that they, it's very likely that they'll be smaller than their flock mates, but they can grow to be adults, but they, they may be a little bit smaller. I had a really tiny, a real little silky, and she was just always small, um, but she she grew up and she was with her flock. So sometimes they don't survive, but, um, but sometimes they do just fine and they'll be a little bit smaller. So Brad hurt herder. I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Asks, how would you introduce new chicks to the flock? So I was just talking about a, a little bit. Um, the main thing that you want to do is you don't want to integrate chicks with an existing flock until they are almost the same size as the adults or their adults themselves. So either, um, and I say that because sometimes people have mixed flocks and so they have bantams and then they have you know, the bantams are never going to be the size of uh, standard chickens. Hold on. So if you have standard size chickens and you have standard size chicks that you want to put together, you're going to want to wait until the chicks are like around 12 weeks old. And it's kind of a pain, but this is the best, the best way to do it because as I was just saying, you know, the adults can, uh, pick on the babies and sometimes they'll kill the babies. So you don't want that to happen. Um, they'll just like, they'll peck their heads until, until they die. And you don't want that. Um, so there is a whole integration process. I do have a video about that. I will leave that in the description and in the show notes. Um, but basically what it is, is you will have, you know, at eight weeks old, they're old enough to be outside. Um, if the weather permits. So they're outside and, but they're in an enclosed area, like a pen with, with fencing where they can see the existing flock and the existing flock can see them, but they can't get to each other. Okay. And you want to continue to grow them out in this, in this pen while they're getting used to each other and they're getting a little bit bigger. Okay. And usually around 12 weeks, you can start to introduce them. Okay. And they'll still, there will, there will still be a pecking, working out of pecking order. Okay. And you will still need to keep an eye on them. Um, if they're itty bitty tiny bantams, you need to wait until they're, you know, like 18 weeks or, or a little bit older because they're so small. And then if you have standards, the little ones, they need to be more confident and they get confident as they get older. Like there's a big difference between, even a 12 week old, uh, pullet and an 18 week old hen, you know, I mean, at that point they, they, they stop putting up with stuff that a pullet will put up with. <laughs> okay. So I hope I'm making sense here. Cause I'm just always thinking about mixed flocks. Cause my flock, my flock is very mixed. Um, so yeah, the main thing is that you want to give them a period where they can see each other, but they can't get to each other. They can work out the pecking order, but they can't hurt each other. And then when you put them together, 
Um, like I said, there will be squabbling. You want to make sure that you have more than one food and water station because the old ones will, will, you know, they'll, the older ones will be kind of cranky at the little ones. Okay. Which is normal. If there is blood being drawn, that's not, you don't want that. Okay. At that point you separate them again and start the process over. But if they're not drawing blood, they may, you know, they're, they may be a little bit of, of working out of the pecking order, but, um, nobody's getting hurt. Then, then that's okay. They're doing okay. They're, they're working it out, but make sure that you check on them several times a day. Okay. All right, guys. Um, I have one more question I'm going to answer. And that is from Roger Stewart, who, Stewart, who asks, how are your silkies? They are doing great. And I, I, um, I did hear a cockadoodle do. I did. I did yesterday morning. I heard a cockadoodle do, uh, from my little boy, Bubblicious. And I actually think another one of them is a boy. And, um, if the other one's a boy, I'm going to be upset, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, um, they're doing great. I do. I will have an update on them in the video on Wednesday, as well as a big, big, big update all about what's going on in Chickenlandia, which is very exciting. Two very, very exciting things happening in Chickenlandia that I want you guys to know all about. So remember, if you want to submit a question to Bok Talk, go to welcome to chickenlandia.com. While you're there, join Chickenlandia Nation which is my mailing list. So you can know everything in advance. And um, I just want to thank you guys so much for joining me today. Thank you to the moderators, 13 Moons Homestead. Thank you to my co-producer, Kelsey Paulus, also known as a Chickenlandia presidential advisor. Thank you to Talking to Crows for editing this episode and to Double M Ranch for her beautiful podcast art. <laughs> If you enjoyed this podcast, please remember to rate and review it. And there's something else I want you guys to remember. You are always welcome in Chickenlandia. <laughs> Bye.